My name's Peter Sumpton, and this is the Marketing Study Lab podcast. A podcast for those that are thinking, have thought and are doing, or already have a marketing qualification. Or even if you haven't, and you just want to know a little bit more about what good, happy marketing is. As we cover a whole host of marketing topics, I chat to some amazing guests, each one a superstar in their own niche. And if you have a burning marketing question already, or after this episode, get in touch. We'll chat it through. Peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. Or find me on LinkedIn. The link is in the show notes. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, this will really help others find this podcast and spread the marketing word. Now let's get on with today's episode. We all know how massively important copy is, and especially copywriting. But how do you do this successfully? What are the skills? What are the tips? What can we learn from a guest that has a very niche copywriting market? Let's talk to Louise Shanahan, a copywriter for the Copy Prescription. And I love that name. You'll find out why in a second. Because Louise writes within two niche marketplaces. Yep. Health, da-da, and the government. Sounds a bit boring? Well, I think Louise will show you differently. Louise also is a fitness nerd and a former civil servant, which helps, as she's writing about these two things a lot. Go figure. Someone who knows an industry, has a passion for it, and has got a niche, actually making a living from these things? Well, I never. And, and that was a bit tongue-in-cheek. Probably shouldn't have written that down before I spoke it because it's lost in translation. Anyway, moving on. Louise believes that compelling copy can save you time, make you money, and more importantly, build a community of loyal fans. And who doesn't want those three things? So, as any good fitness fanatic should know, Louise, does a spoonful of sugar truly make the medicine go down? I love that question. Um, yes, I think so. Everything in moderation, I say. I think sugar is a bit of a villain in the health world these days, and maybe rightly so, but uh, you've still got to enjoy life, don't you? So maybe, let's say, just a teaspoonful of sugar rather than the whole tub of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You, you've got me wondering Ben and Jerry's now, actually, thinking oh, about sorry. it. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's move on. Let's move on quickly. <laughs> Tell us your story. What's been the formula that's brought you to this stage in your career? as a copywriter and jargon buster within the health industry for the copy prescription. Love that name. Yeah, I wonder if I need to change my job title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a... No, no, it's, it's really cool. I've never heard jargon buster, so it's it's, it's refreshing. Um, yeah, well, it's kind of a long story. I didn't go down the traditional agency route. I didn't study marketing I'd say I'm completely self-taught, so I hope I'm still allowed in the marketing study lab community. <laughs> of for course, that. More, than, more than welcome. <laughs> so I was actually interested in health first and then copywriting rather than vice versa. Where I know some people become copywriters and then choose a niche to specialise in, so I kind of did it the other way around. Um, and I got interested in health in my early 20s when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. But happily, that all worked out fine. I'm absolutely fine now. Um, I've actually just had the 10 years all clear sign off from the hospital. Congratulations. So that's Great stuff. Thank you. <laughs> but it definitely triggered an awareness of my health that I hadn't had before. Um, I mean, we all know that we can be hit by these things at any time, don't we? But we probably all take our health for granted a bit until something goes wrong, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I mean, it's a nice a nice place to be when when you do have that kind of that innocence about it and I certainly took my health for granted um so although I was very lucky and I knew that the type of cancer I had was very treatable the doctors were very reassuring from the start I still had to have treatment and it was it was still quite a shock to think that at 22 or 23 my body could let me down like that which yeah. maybe not the best yeah it's maybe not the best way to think about it but that was that was how I felt at the time um, and I'm quite an action focused person. So the whole experience really got me interested in what I could do to take better care of myself. So I got into eating really healthily and exercising more, 
which was quite amusing to my friends and family, I think, because I'd been the total antithesis of sports at that <laughs> point. <laughs> it's, it, I, think, I think it's always amazing. I, I always have this uh, conversation with friends that if you were going to go the other way, you were dead healthy, et cetera, et cetera, and then yeah. you turned into lazy and, and you, you got overweight, et cetera. Hardly anyone would say anything to you. Yeah, but I if know. you go the other way around, it's like if, if you go out and um, you say, oh, no, I'm not drinking tonight. What do you mean you're not drinking? But if you go out and say, oh, I am going to get off my face tonight, everyone's like, yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so that's kind of what happened to me because like, I even got the wooden spoon at school sports day, I think. Like, I literally did no exercise at all. Um, and then suddenly I was going to the gym every day, like drinking kale smoothies and literally going all into the health thing. <laughs> Um, so, and then the other side to that was that, you know, I just graduated from uni. I kind of had to put all my plans on hold so I could have the surgery. So although I knew it was all going to work out, okay, fingers crossed, you know, it was kind of straightforward treatment. Um, I had been planning to go and study and work abroad and it meant I couldn't do that. I couldn't go abroad if I had to have treatment here in Scotland. So I ended up doing temp work for a while and eventually, um, I started working for the Scottish government. So, I mean, to cut a, a long story short, I was there for about 10 years working in a lot of different policy areas, uh, but a big chunk of that time was in public health. So that's sort of tied in with my, my newfound interest in health. So I, I, I'm sure the inner workings of government can be a bit of a mystery to people on the outside, but you can probably imagine there's a lot of writing involved. So this is me trying to make an awkward segue into how I became a writer. <laughs> So, you know, I was writing speeches for government ministers, endless reports and briefings, public awareness campaigns, all of it, loads of different kinds of writing. Uh, and all of it was about communicating to different audiences, trying to persuade them of a particular viewpoint or policy, which is actually really like copywriting. <laughs> so I ended up doing a master's in health policy around that time, which focused quite a bit on behaviour change and calm. So I started thinking about the different approach that we take to messaging around health and how we encourage people to be more healthy. And I thought maybe I'd like to work on this side of things a bit more. Uh, and I was, I had been drawn to the idea of starting my own business. So combining my interest in health, my experience in the sector and my love of writing, I thought mm, maybe I'll be a health writer. And gradually that evolved, <clears throat> excuse me, into health copywriting. So here we are. <laughs> do, do, do you ever look back and, and think that this was almost your, your path? It was just a strange way to get here. Yes, definitely. Because what I'm doing now, I absolutely love it. It, it sounds like a cliche, but it doesn't feel like work at all. That's cool. Um, cool. Yeah. I, I, and I, I know not everybody feels like that. So I know how fortunate that is. But yeah, it does just feel because I was thinking, you know, when I was thinking about coming to chat with you today and I was thinking, how do I tell this story? Because it sort of feels like it's not really linear. So many different um, aspects of my life have kind of come together in the same to the same point. So, yeah, I think it does feel like that in a way. Can you just explain what a, a copywriter does then? Yeah, I think I'm still figuring that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of everything sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, basically, a copywriter writes all the stuff that's designed to get you customers, uh, clients or community to to click buy or to sign up for something or spread your message in some way. So it could be what's written on your website, your social media captions, your email newsletters, blogs, anything really. Uh, and, and as I was kind of saying with the writing for government, it's, it's about writing to persuade, except, you know, in the uh, commercial sector, it's about writing to sell. Um, and to do that well, I think a copywriter has to do a whole lot of research about the client, their voice, their brand positioning, uh, their customers, marketing objectives, you know, what do they actually want the copy to do? And looking at user data before any writing even starts. Um, so, yeah, I think probably I spend the majority of my time on a project doing research and then the writing is a lot quicker after that. So a big portion of what a copywriter does is research. I think you also need to be able to offer insights on the wider marketing strategy too, and sometimes even business strategy, so you can really help your client focus on what they're wanting to get out of the work, uh, so they get the most out of it. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of everything, I would say. Okay, so why are words so important? Because in this day and age, you, you we're all we're all connected and we're all online continuously mm -hmm. and being bombarded yeah. with images and video. Why is the yeah. word still so important? 
Yeah, video is definitely the thing now, isn't it? Yeah, um, if you look at um, you know, YouTube and Instagram, I mean, I think the stat is something like 80% of all consumer internet traffic will be made up of online videos by 2021, wow. Um, wow. which is a little scary for a copywriter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then especially in health, I think, um, when you're talking about things that are really personal and emotional, it's important to be relatable and come across as genuine and trustworthy. And I think video does help you build a rapport in a way that you, you obviously can do with writing. But when people can kind of almost literally look you in the eye and, and hear you talking about who you are and what you stand for, I think you make a real connection. Um, so I do think that, that most businesses that want to connect with their customer in that way definitely need to be thinking about using video marketing. Uh, but of course, the words are still important. Um, you still have to have something to say in those videos. So, you know, the messaging is all, uh, all part of the mix. Um, I think there's probably some debate about whether people are still reading long form content but I mean if the content is good people will read it yeah uh, so I think we just have to keep putting out great quality content that people want to read and then you know evolve around that as we need to so good quality content how do you actually make compelling copy what's I'm not saying there's a secret but how, <laughs> how do you go about doing it because I've, I've read some of your stuff and after reading it I'm, I'm considering becoming a fitness instructor now just so you can write my copy because it's, it's quite cool how you write it <laughs> oh well thank you for that <laughs> see I, I do my research <laughs> yeah. well I think the world needs one more fitness instructor <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah especially especially online and on social media and all that yeah definitely one more <laughs> yeah exactly get your Instagram account going <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, of course, copy has to be compelling. I mean, you might have the best product or service in the world, but if your copy bores the pants off people, no one's going to hang around long enough to find out how you can help them. Um, and I think that's really important in health. You know, as I said, I, I see so many people in the health industry offering great services, but they're too shy to sell them properly, or they're trying to be all buttoned up and formal, or, you know, they just feel icky about selling and the idea of selling to people, like they're trying to tip, trick them into it or mm. something. So it just doesn't work. Um, and people end up clicking away and they end up buying what they think they need from someone else. And, and who knows if that works? Uh, so I always tell my clients that they actually have a duty to have good copy. Uh, I think they're doing their customers a disservice if they let them click away and end up on some other site that's maybe not not the, the best thing for them. Um, so that wasn't quite answering your question, was it? So what's the secret to compelling copy? Um, but I think well, I think you do make you do make a good point there because going back to the images and videos, it's so easy and and we've all done it, clickbait, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, we've clicked onto something and thought this this isn't what I was expecting at all. Yeah, exactly. You know, like if you're on Facebook on something, you see these ads down the side and it says this one weird trick to oh. belly or something. You're yeah. like, no, yeah. don't click. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the thing is, like, if you are a, a personal trainer or a nutritionist or something, you might have a really great service that will help people, um, you know, uh, get fit or whatever. Uh, that's what they'll click on if you don't give them good copy and, and convince them that you have the solution. You know, you can't just kind of uh, expect people to, to just know that. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, so how do you do that? It's a tough one, I think. It's about stories and characters. Um, I mean, I like to think about, well, what do I find compelling when I'm reading something online or even watching a film or reading a novel or whatever? It's about the stories and the characters. So, you know, the story is about uh, the journey that you want your client to go on. It could be about the journey that you have gone on. Um, and the, the characters, again, are you and your clients. So, um, it shouldn't be boring or bamboozling or anything. It should be inspiring to people, capture their imagination and hopefully motivate them to do something. Um, so you can use research to understand what messages to focus on. Because I know that all, that if you're writing your own copy, maybe that sounds a little bit sort of airy-fairy, like, yeah, stories, what does that actually mean? How do I write one? <laughs> So you can research um, to know what messages will resonate with people and what phrases are hitting home. Um, you know, I actually really like looking in uh, Facebook groups for that kind of thing. So, you know, if I was writing copy for a nutritionist, I might look in <clears throat> um, in a Facebook group about nutrition advice or something. I look at the phrases that people are using and then that's kind of how you can make it compelling because it's, it enables you to use the phrases that actually mean something to them. 
Um, so compelling copy is really just about telling stories that people want to hear, about connecting with what matters to your audience and, and really just coming across like a real person, I think. So you sound like them and you care, you're not a bot. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any differences when writing purely for, for digital compared to more traditional print, for example, brochures? Um, I'm not sure there are major differences. I think it's all about writing for the particular audience in question. Um, but to be honest, I haven't done a huge amount of printed work. Most of my projects are online, um, but I have done a couple. And I think the main thing to remember with printed work, work which I had kind of fallen file of, was to think about how the pages will sit side by side. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, think about if, if you have a cover and a back cover, what are the inside pages going to look like side by side? And make sure you have plenty of white space near the center fold and think about how people will hold the hard copy and turn the pages, which obviously is something that you, you're not really thinking about um, with uh, online text in the same way, although you, you, you do still want to make sure that the design is uh, easy for people to, to read and absorb. Um, so you, I think that's maybe more about the design than the text, but maybe others will disagree with me. I, you know, I, I, think, I think it's really, really interesting. <laughs> That you brought up the white space, and I think that's the difference between somebody that knows what they're talking about and somebody that, d that doesn't. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, and you you've got something to write or some copy or some print, whatever it might be, and you see white space, then it's we must fill it. We've got to fill this. Yeah, and it's probably the worst yeah. thing. No, just just write as you need to. Yeah, and I think I mean I suppose the thing that it's kind of similar to online. You want to think about if you've got images, how are they fitting with the text, and um, making sure that the story and the image ties in with the story and the text. Um, but I think mean, you do that online as well, don't mm -hmm. you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you specialize in in copywriting within the health industry and also nonprofits, pu public health, and that was your your backstory, which is is very very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, does it help to be that focused or sometimes can it be prohibitive? That's a really good question. Um, I think it definitely helps to have a niche. Uh, in most industries, if you want to stand out, you've got to be known for something, don't you? Mm -hmm. you? You want to be known as the best at a particular thing or an expert in something. So you're the go-to for that thing. Um, it's like if I was needing heart surgery, I'd want it to be done by a heart surgeon. <laughs> There's nothing but heart surgery every day. You know, if you've done it a thousand times. Oh, come um, on, I'm not doing anything tomorrow if you know anyone that's, yeah. that's struggling. Exactly. You don't want someone who's, who does a bit of heart surgery, a bit of dentistry, <laughs> you know, whatever else. Um, I mean, they might do a great job. They probably have loads of transferable skills. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but, you know, you're just not going to feel as confident. So I think it's the same with copywriting. Um, you know, I write about health topics every day. I read all the, 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 the blogs. I know all the trends. Um, I'm familiar with the regulations and, and, you know, all that kind of thing, common customer profiles and stuff. So I'm not having to start from scratch with my research. I can just kind of hit the ground running. And I think if you have a niche, that just makes the whole process so much more um, straightforward. And you can really, you can be much more helpful to your client. You can give them much more strategic advice about the copy and you know what's going to work. Um, so, yeah, I think it definitely helps having a niche. I mean, as you say, I work with all sorts of clients. Um, so I'm interpreting health quite broadly, actually. <laughs> Um, anything from reports and reviews for health charities to uh, web copy and blog posts for, um, you know, personal trainers, nutrition brands, that kind of thing. But it's all with that same focus of helping people get healthier. And so for me personally, I think having a niche, um, but one that has a bit of variety is quite good because that keeps things interesting for me. But I'm still able to build my expertise within that and position myself as an expert. So, you know, that's it really. It's all about positioning. I want to be known as a health copywriter. So if someone says to you, hey, Peter, do you know anyone who can help with this health project? You'll immediately think, yes, talk to Louise. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Even if you actually know loads of generalist copywriters who could do a great job, you know, I want to be the first person that you think of. So, um, so for your listeners, I would definitely recommend having a niche. It doesn't have to be... Um, you know, it doesn't have to be too specific, um, although some people would say, you know, the more specific you get, then you can kind of bump your prices up and things like that as well. Mm. Um, but it doesn't have to be by industry. It doesn't have to be, you know, health or finance or whatever. It could be the, the type of copy that you write. So, you know, I know people who specialize in email marketing or do nothing but social media or just web copy or blog posts or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely say having a niche has helped me.
Have you seen a change in, in your style of writing to suit how we all communicate now through social media and messaging services? Um, yeah, I think I think it's always evolving, isn't it? I think the biggest change in my writing style personally probably came after I left government um, because I was writing, suddenly I was free to write as myself. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say a bit, a bit more yeah. freedom. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think of a tactful way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I love working for government, but um, yeah, I think there aren't quite so many restrictions on the style of writing um, when you write for personal brands and that kind of thing. I think that's what it all comes down to. You know, you kind of, you should write like you speak um, and people will connect with that. So, you know, as I was saying before, it's all about uh, writing to make a connection with people. So the way that you write has to evolve to um, to connect with them so that you, you're reflecting how they speak. So that's one of the, the reasons why I'm enjoying working with charities and public sector organisations, because I'm able to help them communicate their message in a way that's a bit more digestible and try and, as you say, become the jargon buster and banish mm. that policy speak. Mm. <laughs> OK, speaking of um, jargon busting, are you ready for some quick fire questions? Yes, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always try and make that seamless. and uh, <laughs> It wasn't seamless. Anyway, name one must read business book. Um, it's not really a business book, but I'm going to say The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova, which I've been reading. Do you want me to say a bit about it or is that not quick no, fire? G- no, go for, no, go for it. It's not a test. It's not a test. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's full of all these great stories about con men and the crazy confidence tricks that they've managed to pull off, um, which tells us so much about why people want to believe certain things. <laughs> And why they fall for these tricks, even if they think we want, they won't. You know, we all think that we won't fall for these scams, mm-hmm. but people do. Um, so I'm really interested in the psychology of it, which I think really ties in with marketing. So we just have to use our powers for good, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, just a quick, quick story. And I think it, it, it's one of those times where I've looked back and thought, oh, I can't believe they've got me there. We moved, we moved into a, a house about four or five years ago when it all, all needed doing. So we got a uh, double glazing in and he sat there and he was, he was talking and he was giving us this spiel and I was like yeah whatever yeah yeah all oh, right okay you're reducing the price wow fantastic oh speak to your boss yeah yeah, yeah. great 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 <laughs> and then he it, two things he did he he he, he said he, sh- he showed us this text message where he said well actually the prices are going up tomorrow look I've got this text message <laughs> and I thought yeah I bet you've got a text message for every single day but yeah. then the second thing he did, he said, oh, I've just come from this client and somebody tried to break into their house last night and, and they tried, but they couldn't get through because our security is that good. And he showed mm-hmm. me the picture and it was this damaged uh, door which they hadn't yeah. broken into. And I thought, wow, that's really good. And it didn't even click that I bet he's shown that to everybody and he hasn't just come <laughs> from there. And I felt such a fool. And we bought off him as well. <laughs> oh, well, I think if it works, maybe it's okay. But... Yeah, yeah. I just you know, When you just feel a bit stupid because you think, yeah, that was just a trick. <laughs> oh, well, you should definitely read the confidence game then. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I need to. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> back to quick fire questions. Uh, what was the last thing you googled? Oh uh, yeah, I just checked this. It was um, when did people start showering? <laughs> <laughs> I'm researching an article about the evolution of our attitude to dirt. <laughs> it's for a skincare client. So, um, yeah, my, my Google search is full of odd questions about personal hygiene. <laughs> I, 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 I like to think, say, in, in 50, 60, 70, 100 years' time, you know, when, when people look back at people's lives, the first thing they'll do is just put the name in and type Google searches and it'll come up with every single search they did on Google and people just look at it and think, what the hell were they thinking? Yeah, what a weird story this person's life is following. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's always interesting. Uh, What is your most used app at the moment? Um, I think it's probably a, a tie between Podcast Addict and Evernote. I'm obsessed with pod- podcasts. Um, cool. And uh, I, I use them together when I listen to the podcast and I hear something that I like or something I want to remember or come back to. Then I make the note in Evernote. So, yeah, I'm constantly fl- uh, flicking between those two apps when I'm walking. <laughs> what is your favorite theory, concept or methodology? Um, in copywriting, I think probably the one really simple concept that that I really like that I always want to kind of hold on to is to remember that it's not about you it's about the reader Mm -hmm. so 
always ask yourself, so what? Uh, I'm always, when I'm writing copy for myself or for other people, I'm always asking that question, so what, so what? So you can really dig into what it means for your customer. So say your new gym has 50 state-of-the-art new bikes, so what? Mm. <laughs> what does that mean for your customer? Why will they care? And I think if you focus on the benefits to the reader, then your copy will become that much stronger. Um, it sounds simple, but it's actually quite tough in practice because when we have a great product or service to sell, we're excited about the features. You know, that's what we've been focusing on. Um, but that's not really what makes the emotional connection with the reader or customer, which is what's needed if you want them to buy or sign up or whatever. Um, so, yeah, always ask what's in it for them. Great tip as well. What's the one word or sentence? that is overused at the moment? <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> um, Rockstar. <laughs> uh, you see this on LinkedIn all the time, don't you? Rockstar writers, rockstar developers, rockstar designers. <laughs> yeah. I think if I was hiring, I wouldn't want a rockstar. Well, want... that's true, yeah. <laughs> I want someone who's more of a rock. <laughs> <laughs> see, someone... there, there you go. That's what you need to uh, start pushing. Yeah, well, I'm a rock. I'm reliable. I'm steady. I'll get the job done. <laughs> oh, I like that analogy. I love a good analogy. That is superb. <laughs> good, good, good place to end. So if people want to find out more about the copy prescription or get in touch with you, where should they go? Yeah, sure. So um, my website is thecopyprescription.com. Uh, you can sign up for emails there. Um, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. It's just Louise Shanahan. And on Instagram, it's the copy prescription. Um, I'm on Twitter and Facebook, but I don't really use them that much. I can't remember what my Twitter handle yeah. is. <laughs> Excellent. Great stuff. Uh, Louise, pleasure chatting to you today. And, and thank you very, very much for joining us. You too, Peter. Thanks very much for having me. Louise, thanks once again. Some absolute golden nuggets there. But what can we take away from that little chat? Well, first of all, what is your skill? What is your niche? Louise has had a career which has been guided, some would say, by her personal life, but she's always utilised this to her advantage, which is now also her niche and the, the niche she's thriving in. You could say from wooden spoon to gym fanatic, you make your own future. So what's your future going to be? Something to think on. But once you have your niche, how do you thrive in this particular community? Well, Louise maximised her knowledge of government and health, as well as being very relatable, genuine and trustworthy. Plus, add video marketing into this, and this can prove to be a great platform to relate to your target market, as long as the messages you are conveying are relative and for good. And finally, copywriting can help persuade and sell, which is basically good marketing fundamentals. Louise tells her clients that they actually have a duty to have good copy as they will be doing their customers a disservice if they let them click away. If you have a great product or service, you need to use the right platforms along with the right messages to stand any chance of surviving. And that goes for any type of business. <laughs> If you'd like to know more about what we do here at Marketing Study Lab, then just go to marketingstudylab.co.uk and I'll see you there or I'll see you on the next episode. Happy marketing.